Hello everybody and welcome back to another Simple Science video. Today we're going to be carrying on the A-level biology revision series and this is part two and today's topic is on cell structure. So uh, let's get started. The first thing which we need to do is to distinguish the types of cells. Now it can be categorized into two main groups. The first group is prokaryotic which means no nucleus which means the DNA is lying free in the cytoplasm. There's no nucleus structure. And the second group is eukaryotic, which means it contains a nucleus. Now, a common example that you know of a prokaryotic cell would be bacteria. And eukaryotic cells, common examples you would know is fungi, animals, so you and me, plants. Now, protista and protosis are the same thing. It's just singular and plural nouns. What I mean by unicellular, so you and me were made up of a lot of eukaryotic cells, whereas protista or protosis organisms are only made up of one eukaryotic cell. Another thing to keep in mind is prokaryotic cells are much smaller than eukaryotic cells. And the main thing, the main feature for them is that their DNA lies free in the cytoplasm. Now before we move on to see what features distinguish between these two, let's go and check out what features a prokaryotic cell will have always and sometimes doesn't have. All right, so now let's look at the prokaryote cell features. Now, for your exam, I would just recommend remembering this column. Now, if you see that the number one hint that it's a prokaryotic cell is that if the cell wall is made up of murine, which is a peptidoglycan, which is a compound, now, if it has these features, so cell wall, cell surface membrane, cytoplasm, circular DNA, and ribosomes, then it could possibly be a prokaryotic cell. So just keep that in mind. Now, additional features are just flagellum and infloating. This CSM is just cell surface membrane. I just abbreviated it. A capsule for protection, plasmid, and pili for attachment. Now, that's not here on this diagram, Pili, but it's just when bacteria, they want to attach to another cell, then they just have extensions. So that's what Pili is. So for your exam, just remember this table, but more specifically, remember these points. Now, let's just quickly check out viruses. Now, viruses aren't really considered living things. Therefore, it wasn't in the cell chart because they do not do the seven things. So Mrs. Nerg, they don't carry that out. Now, these are some important notes on viruses. First thing is they do not have a cell structure and they're not considered living, as I said, because they do not carry out the seven things, the seven living Mrs. Nerg concept. And more importantly, they do not have a partially permeable membrane. Now, here is just a simple diagram of one of the most simplest viruses. Viruses, they work by taking in a whole cell and then taking over their ribosomes to create more of themselves. Therefore, they can't really replicate unless they're inside a whole cell, which is one of the reasons why they're not considered living. So, yeah, just a very simple structure of a simple virus. All right, now let's move on to the main topic, which is animal cell structure. Now, this is just a little content or background information we have to use electron microscopes which i covered in the previous video so if you are unsure about electron microscopes please do go check that out and this is just a animal cell structure for reference which i will be ref um sorry which i'll be referring to throughout the next part of the video now division labor it means that each organelle has a specific job now, what is an organelle? Just like how we have organs in our body, like the heart, the lungs, the liver, etc., a cell has its own organelles, organs, which are known as organelles. Now, let's take a look at the largest organelle in the animal cell structure, which is the nucleus. Now, if you look at this diagram here, you can see that this is the nucleus, and it is made up of certain things. So... Nucleus is the headquarters of the cell, and I'll get to why that is in just a minute. First of all, the nucleolus. It's the darkest, densest spot that you see on the diagram. Now, why is it the darkest, densest spot? It's because it contains chromatin. Now, chromatin is simply loosely coiled chromosomes. So just keep in mind that the nucleolus is the darkest spot within the nucleus itself. 
And then we have the nuclear membrane. So the, the nuclear membrane is what surrounds the nucleus. As you can see, a nuclear envelope, also known as nuclear envelope. It is a double membrane. And just like cell surface membrane, it controls what goes in and out of the nucleus. Now, if you can see the little gaps here and there, it's basically nuclear pores, as it says here. And what that is, is just gaps for substances, big substances, which cannot pass through the membrane to go in and out. And specifically, what substances? And here's a detailed, a more, you know, 3D diagram, just to help you visualize, of the nucleus. Now, you may ask, what substances go in and out of the nucleus? Well, the nucleus makes its own ribosomes and makes its own mRNA. And these ribosomes and mRNA are passed out into the cell. And why are they needed? They're needed for things such as protein synthesis, you know, uh, to help make nucleotides, to help make ATP, to help make hormones, and a whole bunch of things. And as I mentioned here, the nucleus controls the activities of the cell. So they're the headquarters, they're the boss. Now why? That is because the nucleus controls, <coughs> I'm sorry, excuse me, the DNA inside the nucleus, not all DNA is useful. Only some DNA is useful. And that useful part is called the genes. Now, the genes is what is expressed by the ribosomes and the mRNA, which is coded within the nucleus. And because it controls the things which control the proteins and things like that, it basically controls the activities of the cell and the inheritance of the cell. So the nucleus is the boss of the cell and it's actually a 3D structure made up of these three things. Now let's move on to the second organelle which is the endoplasmic reticulum also known for short as ER. Now what a what is the endoplasmic reticulum? So on the diagram here, I've made it bigger, is these foldy parts, as you can see. Where is it? Yes. Rough endoplasmic reticulum, and then there's the smooth endoplasmic reticulum, which is basically, the endoplasmic reticulum is continuous with the outer membrane of the nucleus. So as I mentioned before, the nucleus membrane or the nucleus envelope is a double membrane and the outer membrane is just continuous. So it's just folds and continuality of the outer membrane of the nuclear envelope. Now it can be split up into two and it has the rough endoplasmic reticulum, which I'll get to why it's rough in a minute. But basically the endoplasmic reticulum, if you want to visualize it, it's just an extensive network of sacs or just membranes and folds. And whatever reactions or whatever things that happen here can be separated from what happens in the rest of the cytoplasm within the rest of a cell. And basically these sacs are connected to form an extensive network and it's just like a parking lot with a ramp. So it goes zigzag, zigzag, as you can see here, zigzag, zigzag. That's what it is. Now, why is a certain section is called the rough ER? And it's rough because it contains these things and contains these things called ribosomes. And we'll get to what that is in a minute, but just keep that in mind. And this is the main site for protein synthesis within the cell. Okay? And then the second part is the smooth ER, which, why is it called smooth? It beca it's because it doesn't have these things called ribosomes, so therefore it's a more smoother and more flatter surface and this the what do you call it the function of the smooth ER is the synthesis of steroids and breakdown of substances such as toxins and cystinae are simply folds of the membrane so it forms when I say form cystinae it means when it folds it just it's just the folding of the membrane to be honest all right, now mentioning ribosomes, let's move on to the next slide, which talks about ribosomes. As soon as you see ribosomes, you should link it to the site of protein synthesis. The function of ribosomes is the site of protein synthesis. If you want the mark, just write this down. Now, ribosomes are teeny tiny structures. They're only 25 nanometers, and they're made up of RNA <coughs> and a protein. And... You can see here on the diagram, ribosomes are these little black dots. So they're very, very tiny. 
and they come in two forms. They come in 80s ribosome and 70s. And when I say forms, I mean size. You can ignore these units on top. Now these 80s ribosomes, which are the bigger ones, are found in the RER, so rough endoplasmic reticulum, and are just found free about hanging in the cytoplasm. And the 70s ribosomes are found in the mitochondria and also chloroplasts in plant cells. And I'll get to why this makes a difference in a minute and what theory it suggests actually. And the proteins which are made in the rough endoplasmic reticulum. They're first made in the RER and as they move through to the SER, they are then modified. So it's basically like a process. First RER, the proteins are made and then the SER modifies their proteins on their way throughout the sac. 